Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, side event on uh, promoting uh, youth engagement in responsible innovation under the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, this side event is uh, taking place on the margin of the BWC meeting of Expert 2 today. Uh, before we formally uh, start, uh, I'd like to highlight that this is uh, uh, an interactive uh, event, so uh, please uh, feel free to post questions in the chat or ask for the floor through uh, the raise your hand uh, function. Um, and uh, we will give you uh, the floor to interact with our panelists. Uh, please make sure that uh, if you don't have the floor, your microphone is uh, muted. And uh, with that, uh, I think we can take this uh, slide out. And I'm very pleased to pass the floor to my fellow co-organizers to formally open this side event. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Stephanie Norlock, who is a program officer at the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, and Mr. Matthew Watson, who is a senior analyst at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you so much, Remy, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I will just echo uh, Remy's sentiments to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, and welcome to this event. Um, this very dynamic and interactive event is the product of collaboration between the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, or IFBA, the International Genetically Engineered Machine, IGEM, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, the Nuclear Threat Initiative Biological Policies and Programs, NTI Bio, and the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs, or UNODA. And this collaboration and common support of youth inclusion in biological disarmament affairs will feature several young innovators who have conducted concrete action for responsible science under the BWC and highlight the need for continued and further integration um, of youth perspectives in official BWC decision making and subsequent ongoing work in support of the convention. As today and tomorrow's health security workforce and decision makers, youth biosecurity professionals play a crucial role in our collective vision of the advancement of science and technology. Where they have been tasked with the future's evolving biosecurity landscape, it is imperative that they are increasingly included at present to provide their unique perspectives and technical expertise to emerging and ongoing health security issues. Responsible innovation in science and technology is a shared commitment across scientific and diplomatic professional communities, requiring consistent engagement from both parties to effectively prevent, detect, and respond to health security threats. The promotion of a multi-sectoral and multilateral youth network in biosecurity diplomacy aims to bridge the gap between policy design and implementation in this regard. In this regard. Accomplished, driven, and future-oriented, these youth biosecurity specialists will address throughout this event how they envision an innovative and biosecure future with respect to the BWC, as well as what they have accomplished to date uh, to contribute to this respective uh, and collective goal. And so with that, I will keep my um, comments very short. Um, and thank you very much again for the opportunity. I will pass the floor to Matthew. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and I will keep my remarks even shorter. Um, just to say that as a preview of today's proceedings, we will hear first from several colleagues drawn from our rapidly growing and global community of practice that will describe their aspirations for the future of multilateral biosecurity, including priorities, opportunities, and challenges. Following that discussion, we will be joined by several other colleagues who represent and will certainly touch on the innovative thinking and commitment that will be needed to ensure that tomorrow's biosecurity landscape is as robust and adaptive as it will surely need to be. We are looking forward to today's, dis to today's discussion and to featuring the energy and dynamism that characterizes our community. As one preliminary observation, though, it is worth saying that one thread that runs through all of our networks and indeed makes us a network of networks is a deep and abiding commitment to the norms enshrined in the Biological Weapons Convention. It may also be worth noting that the NGOs and academic organizations who have traditionally followed, described, and supported the treaty's implementation have occasionally been referred to as friends of the BWC. One key takeaway we hope to impress upon you today is that that group of friends includes a rising generation 
that is ready, willing, and eager to lend its support to this critical international institution. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. It is now my pleasure to turn uh, back to Remy to introduce our first panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt and Stephanie, for, for your remarks. Uh, I'm delighted to, to open this uh, first panel discussion uh, and introduce our five panelists uh, today. Uh, we have Mr. Geoffrey Otim from Uganda, Mrs. Isha Berry from Canada, uh, Mr. Javier Rodriguez from Argentina, also from Argentina, Mrs. Mayra Amineiros, and Mr. Suryesh Namdeo from uh, India. So as just mentioned by Matt, this uh, first panel discussion is dedicated to hearing from young scientists uh, on their experience, engaging on biosecurity issues, science diplomacy and disarmament uh, overall as it relates to, uh, to the BWC. Um, this first panel aims at understanding uh, how the co-organizers initiatives uh, have uh, participated to the preparation of those uh, young scientists on uh, BWC related topics on biosecurity and also to hear from them on their aspirations for, for the future of, of multilateral biosecurity as we are state parties are currently uh, the discussing uh, MX2 uh, topics. Um, this uh, panel is interactive, so please feel free uh, to uh, ask questions to our young scientists. I can see that we have here with us today a lot of uh, alumni from uh, our different initiatives as well, so it's a pleasure to, to have you with us uh, and please don't hesitate to, to uh, join the conversation. All our panelists today uh, have been engaged in one or more of the initiatives uh, coordinated, organized by the co-organizers. And they often pursued their interest and their engagement in biosecurity through local or regional uh, youth-led initiatives. And uh, they will tell us more about that today. So in that sense, my, my first uh, series of questions is a very uh, general one to, uh, to give uh, 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 our panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves, their background and their engagement uh, in uh, the, the initiatives they've been uh, a part of. So could you uh, tell us more about uh, your engagement as young scientists in, uh, in biosecurity? Uh, can you tell us more about the, the initiatives you've, you've been joining, uh, what they consisted of, how you joined, uh, what they maybe brought to you and uh, how they prepared you for uh, for following uh, uh, BWC related topics. Uh, and with that, I, I'd like to, to start uh, giving the floor uh, to uh, the first, our first panelist, uh, Geoffrey, if you wanna, if you wanna start, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Remy, for giving me the floor. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, NTI, UNODA, IGM, Jones Hopkins Center for Health Security and all the partners that came together to put together this wonderful uh, side event. I'm so happy to be one of the uh, panelists. Yes, uh, to start with the introduction, my name is uh, Tim Geoffrey and I'm from Uganda. Um, I must say uh, I'm a molecular biologist uh, by training. So I've been involved uh, more into this synthetic biology and biosecurity uh, starting way back in 2017. So in brief, I'm the founder of Sinway Africa. I'm sure one of you, uh, all of you have ever heard about Sinway Africa. So I'm the founder of Sinway Africa. But before the founding of Sinway Africa, there are, you know, the background steps that uh, I took before I did that. So the first opportunity that I got was actually a biosecurity fellowship program. And uh, it was sponsored by Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And that was my first engagement in the area of biosecurity. Uh, we were selected, uh, I think about uh, 20 scientists and sponsored to go and attend the SIN Bio uh, SB7 Synthetic Biology Conference in Singapore. 
And that's where I happened to meet uh, many thought leaders within synthetic biology arena. And I had to interact with uh, a lot of people. And so um, the main aim of our biosecurity, you know, um, our fellowship program was, you know, to build our capacity in the area of uh, biosecurity, you know, so that when we come back to our country or our region, we can spread the news to other scientists. So I happened to, uh, we happened to get, uh, you know, international uh, facilitation from uh, uh, thought leaders like said, uh, Beth Cameroon from NTI. So it was a very good experience and uh, interactive. So from there, um, I, uh, that is when now I came back and started the initiative of having seen by Africa and also uh, starting the first uh, IGM team from East Africa that successfully participated and represented at the Jamboree in Boston. So after, after that first opportunity, um, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security again trusted me for the second time. Uh, they gave me another biosecurity fellowship program, this time to uh, go and attend uh, the SynBioBeta conference in San Francisco in uh, California. So uh, this was another uh, interesting experience that we were brought together as young scientists across the globe, you know, to, uh, I mean, to exchange ideas and share what are challenges we have in relation to biosecurity in, in our particular regions. So it was another, another opportunity that I had to, you know, develop my capacity in the area of biosecurity and strengthen uh, my capacity in passing on the knowledge about uh, biosecurity to other scientists, especially in Africa. And then um, uh, through the experiences that I passed through, uh, the two biosecurity fellowships that I got, uh, I was, um, this gave me another opportunity to be, you know, uh, single out or, or, or selected to participate uh, in the Global South Biosecurity Diplomacy uh, Conference. And uh, we were sponsored uh, about, uh, I think, around 30. And I can see some of uh, my colleagues who were together, they're also here. So this was another high level biosecurity workshop that uh, I happened to participate. So um, putting them together, this is uh, the backbone of uh, what I'm trying to do at the moment. I'm also trying to do what I learned from all these three uh, fellowship programs. So. Uh, in my next uh, uh, speech, I will be giving some of the initiative that at least I've, uh, you know, I'm trying to do in Africa in relation to the biosecurity uh, program. So um, basically, I'm happy that all these experiences that I've got has brought me here today to speak to you at uh, the BWC uh, side event. I'm happy for that. Thank you so much, Remy. Thank you very much, Geoffrey, and uh, yes, uh, we'll certainly uh, uh, talk a bit later about the uh, Think Bio Africa, which is an important initiative that, that you are leading. Um, I'd like to, to give now the floor to, to Isha to tell us more about the, the LB Fellowship and the initiative she's been part of. Isha, you over to you. Yes, thank you so much, <clears throat> and thank you all for, for having me here. Um, and to, to Matthew Watson, especially for inviting me. Um, so my name is Isha. I'm a PhD candidate in epidemiology at University of Toronto. And my research really focuses on um, emerging infectious disease threats um, and natural spillover events and how to um, predict and prevent um, and prepare for them. So I really came into biosecurity from the public health side and uh, the natural processes side so understanding how humans and animals interact and what that means for emerging threats um, in, in, across the world. Uh, and so I joined uh, LB, so the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Initiative, uh, as part of the 2020 uh, and now 2021 cohort. Um, and it's really been a very interesting and exciting experience for me um, to really be engaged in biosecurity with respect to um, sort of the BWC and understand 
the synergies and interactions between public health, biosecurity, um, <clears throat> and, and bioweapons, and, and just understand how all of these together, um, you know, we all play a part in, in supporting uh, the BWC, even from a public health standpoint. Um, and so the LB program is really quite interdisciplinary. So I found that being part of the program, um, we're, we're bringing all of these different perspectives together. Uh, you, you have people that have a very public health or very applied background or who have a virology or biology background who work in syn synthetic biology and um, or chemistry. Uh, and you bring all of these people together and in, in all of our meetings, you get these opportunities to discuss um, multiple issues from different perspectives and understand how uh, as young leaders and as how emerging leaders, we really can support each other. So I'd really come from a public health background and not really had a full grasp of what um, the BWC entailed and what biosecurity um, in terms of deliberate threats entailed and how to prevent that. Um, but of course, uh, you know, working in health trends and surveillance and public health surveillance, um, it's, it's a really important part to understand that strong health systems, strong public health security, strong public health infrastructure and surveillance systems have dual purposes um, and really preparing and integrating public health leaders into biosecurity, I think is really important as we've seen um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think as, as we'll continue to see as we move forward, um, you know, public health has an integral role in, in preventing, but also in responding to public health, uh, into to, uh, biosecurity emergencies and um, bio, uh, bio threats. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the, the LB program has been tremendously beneficial for me in opening my eyes to um, the breadth of, of biosecurity um, initiatives uh, and, and the impact and the importance of the BWC. Uh, and the role that public health has to play in that. So it's been a very, uh, you know, great privilege to be part of uh, that initiative. And while each year is only about, um, you know, a, a, a smaller amount of people, um, it is really, I think, as Matt, uh, Matt said earlier, it's like a, a small and growing community of practice. So um, it's been a real, real interesting and real privilege to be part of that uh, growing alumni network. Um, and, and and see how how we can find those synergies between different people's um, backgrounds and experiences, but our same goal of really um, protecting and, and uh, supporting population health and um, well-being. So uh, that's that's me, and I'm looking forward to chatting with everybody today and, and hearing more about everyone's perspectives and everyone's experiences and what's led them to biosecurity as well. Thanks a lot, Isha. And it, it, it's great to, to see how the network uh, uh, are, are growing uh, recently for, for the International Youth Day. We've uh, organized uh, a joint event with, uh, between the LB Fellow and the Youth for Biosecurity Cohort. And some uh, of the LB Fellow are former um, Youth for Biosecurity alumni. So it's great to see how complementary the different initiatives uh, can be. Uh, uh, our next uh, panelist uh, also has participated in, in two different initiatives and maybe uh, he can tell us more about how complementary they, they happen to be. Uh, Javier, if you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell us more, the, the floor is yours. Hi Remy, hi everyone. Pleasure to be online with all of you. So my case is a little bit different uh, I work for the National Commission of Atomic Energy uh, here in Argentina and I'm head of the Environment, Safety and Security Department. So essentially it's a nuclear field, it's a different uh, arena, but it do have some similarities to the uh, biological, biological world, so to say. Uh, so uh, telling a little bit about myself, um, I started a program on uh, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction back in 2016, I think 17. And impressive, uh, again, a lot of knowledge uh, and interest there. But uh, after that, uh, to be honest, nothing happened for a while. After I saw online, I think by social media, I think it was Twitter, a call for competition uh, organized by NTI Bio. 
I'm seeing some guys from MTI here, so I also want to say hi. I think Haley Sarah is online. So if you're listening, hi, Haley. And so along with two colleagues, uh, we participated. Uh, one guy from Uganda, Peter Babigumira, and Dr. Francis Batcher from UK. So we participated in this uh, biosecurity competition organized, as I said, by NTI Bio and the Next Generation of GHSA Network. Uh, we won the competition with our proposal, Act Like a Pro. We was basically an online tool uh, by for uh, security learners uh, who might be interested in having a career in biosafety and biosecurity sector. And this tool actually is uh, still available and running. I check it out uh, some years before, so uh, I could share that if, if any of you are interested. Um, uh, it's hosted by the Infectious Diseases Institute of Uganda. And so uh, it was my, my, my first experience working in the biosecurity and biosafety field. And after that, that I keep on being engaged with many initiatives uh, organized by NTI, uh, participating in the Global Biosecurity Dialogue uh, on a personal uh, uh, fashion, I think 2019 in Ethiopia and uh, also um, on online fashion. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Javier. And I know that you also have uh, been conducting a, a, a national local initiative uh, and uh, leading on it, so we can also discuss that a bit later. Uh, Mayra, uh, also for, from Argentina, I, uh, most of you know Mayra already because uh, she was kind enough to, to, del to represent the Youth for Biosecurity cohort uh, at the MX1 on, on Monday. Uh, but Mayra, you've also been participating and you're still participating in a number of, of initiatives uh, and your engagement uh, in biosecurity is um, is multiple, I think. So uh, if you want to tell us more about that, uh, uh, over to you. Hi, Remy. Well, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be in this panel discussion today. So to start my introduction, as a brief introduction, my name is Mayra Meneiros. I'm a biochemist from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I got a master's degree in blood banks and two professional certifications from IFPA, one in virus management and the other one in biosecurity. I'm currently pursuing a postgraduate uh, degree on international security and disarmament and non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And currently I'm working as an innovation fellow uh, at Pandemic Tech, and then working as a biosafety and biosecurity consultant. And I will say that uh, my commitment as a young scientist in biosecurity issues is very diverse, as Remy said, because fortunately I'm part of many of the initiatives that we are presenting today. And I hope to be part, of course, of those that I'm not yet involved, such as the LV Fellowship and the Youth for Disarmament. So honestly, um, I cannot find a better example than to say that uh, I know almost <laughs> everyone on this panel today, and this shows uh, that although we know they are all different initiatives, uh, they are all interrelated and connected. Uh, so creating this network of young scientists who are looking for the same thing, things that's uh, strengthening the global health security. So regarding the initiatives which I'm part of, uh, there are many of them, so it's IDEM, it's NextGen, IFBA, Youth for Biosecurity, and among others. So today I think I will stand a little bit in this question, and I, I promise I will not extend a lot in the rest of them, but uh, I, I think it's very necessary to introduce all of these initiatives and that all the young leaders and champions in biosafety and biosecurity as us could just be involved if they don't know these initiatives. So I will start with IDEM. Uh, I'm part of the uh, of IDEM as a member of the Safety and Security Committee. IDEM is an amazing place where you could start working on a research project on synthetic biology and being able to work in a multidisciplinary group uh, at the same time. So in addition, I think it's important to, to be sure that all the safety procedures are in place. So our work at the Safety and Security Committee is exactly that. So we give expert advice and on potential safety and security issues in the competition. 
So with the competition, I think something that's very interesting is that you could be involved being very young and being maybe undergraduate student. So I think that's something different that IGEN has at the competition. Um, now I will speak a little bit about Nexion. Uh, Nexion is the Next Generation Global Health Security Network. That's the formal long name. And we say Nexion just to uh, not speak a lot about the name of the institution organization. Um, I'm Argentina coordinator and I'm a member of the Mentorship Council. Nexion has a mentorship program that lasts eight months where, uh, for example, MNT uh, is paired with a mentor. And the idea is that the MNT could work on a research project by, their, by his own or her own. And in that way, your mentor will guide you during the whole process of the mentorship program. So the best project uh, will be recognized. And if we have the opportunity, we'll be published in conferences or events as, for example, this happened some years ago. Uh, one of the most important events uh, related with Nexion is of course the famous NTI Nexion biosecurity competition, as Javier said, uh, which is, uh, I also presented among the NTI um, initiative about uh, this initiative some months ago. So. Uh, I think Jonas is today with us too, and he was part of that too uh, when we presented the, the biosecurity competition. So this year, the competition was focused on, on writing an innovative and creative paper for an online publication uh, by NTI and Nexion. And the question was what life sciences research should be conducted, if any. So this opened the floor to discuss about new technologies, uh, security concerns. Uh, we may have about all of these, of course, new technologies. So the politicians do use the misuse, the misuse and so on. Uh, all of uh, you that don't know about this competition should definitely search about it and register for the next year competition because it's really very insightful. Um, now I'm going to speak a little bit about the use for biosecurity. And um, use for biosecurity, uh, this initiative comes because of the UNODA Biosecurity and Diplomacy Workshop that was done this year and which I was part of, and some of my colleagues that are present today were too. And this was one of the most, I would say, insightful experiences I ever had on biosecurity and science diplomacy. The workshop addresses like so many issues and you could connect with real diplomats. And I think that was something that's uh, kind of very different from maybe other initiatives. Um, and the network we created after the workshop is just outstanding. And we are all the time sharing opportunities. For example, we are now working on a collaborative uh, paper about, for example, with microbes, science and technology developments that are relevant to the BWC. So uh, we are involving a lot of different opportunities after the workshop. So I think that's the network we want to create. And, and also uh, I have the opportunity to present the whole initiative, the Youth for Biosecurity Initiative this Monday at the minute of Experts One of the BWC. And that was, I would say, one of the best experience um, I think that we had in my professional career. Um, I still, I think I don't believe that delegates were, uh, and the state parties uh, were asking me questions in connect in, and were very interested in connecting with young scientists. So um, I feel like the gap we have in connecting both worlds uh, the science and, and the diplomacy world, uh, it was reduced at base. So therefore, I think we need to work on more opportunities like this um, to raise awareness on how important it is to maintain these long lasting relations between science and diplomacy. Um, they have the power to create uh, a change and take actions. I'm saying, I'm talking about diplomats and we are the ones who may orientate those strategies based on our scientific knowledge. So I think to have these connections with science diplomacy is very, very important for us as being scientists and more as being young scientists. Um, and well, now, and lastly, <laughs> I promise I will not speak more. Uh, I will uh, tell something about uh, the IFA mentorship program. As I got to professional certification for NIFA, one in virus management and the other one in biosecurity, I was a mentor during the 2020 and 21 IFA mentorship program. And I think um, one, uh, I'm, I would say, I think I, I'm one of the uh, only mentors that, that has two mentees, as Stephanie could say that. 
Um, but you're usually paired when lentil with woman D and you will learn a lot with this program. And Stephanie will give you, uh, as she's the program coordinator, different monthly topics to discuss with your mentee and your mentor. And the result of this, um, uh, of this whole year of the mentorship program is just that you are going to end that mentorship program like full of new knowledge. Um, it's amazing the way um, that you are actually being actualized all the time with this mentorship program and how you could master your biosafety and biosecurity skills. So I think that all of these initiatives just uh, complement so well. And in addition, you will develop new skill, you, you skills, you will uh, gain more knowledge and you will connect with many colleagues that are interested in the same topics that you are. So I think kind of this will be <laughs> the last thing I will say. This is kind of a resume that uh, all of these initiatives are very interconnected and they are, I would say, um, very necessary. So if you just don't know one of them, I think it's very awesome if you could just be involved. Thank you very much, Maida, for, for explaining all those uh, initiatives you've been part of and uh, no worries about the time it takes because I, I think it, uh, it illustrates the number of, uh, of different initiatives you, you're, you're being uh, engaged in. Um, and thanks also for uh, already suggesting some leads on how to bridge uh, the gap between uh, sci science world area and the, the diplomatic area. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, objectives of many of, of the initiatives you've been talking about. And, and uh, I know that our last and next uh, panelist is particularly in, uh, involved in, in science diplomacy. So it's, uh, I think, a, a nice uh, also introduction and, and transition to, uh, to, his, uh, to his experience. Uh, so yes, if you want to tell us more about the initiative you've been part of, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Remy. And thanks to all the organizers for organizing this. So very, very, already very interesting uh, panel discussion. I'm already learning a lot here. And uh, I have been uh, attending virtually all these uh, meetings of uh, uh, MX, MX1, MX2, and so on. It has been really great experience so far. So uh, hello, good afternoon, good evening, uh, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Suryes. I currently work as the Program Officer of India's uh, Science, uh, Technology, and Innovation Policy Fellowship Program at the Ministry of Science and Technology in India. Uh, so here, uh, my basic role is uh, more on overall coordination and management of the program. But on top of that, I also do uh, my individual research work and uh, also work as a practitioner in the area of science diplomacy and science policy making. Uh, I have been involved in uh, a formulation of India's upcoming science and technology policy. And uh, I have also worked with India's Ministry of uh, External Affairs uh, in a partnership uh, on, a, on a project called Emerging Technology Initiative, where we uh, try to build some strategy roadmaps for different uh, emerging technologies, including biotechnology and uh, uh, genome editing and so on. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, biosecurity and uh, disarmament related areas, I'm still relatively new. Uh, I have been a part of uh, two big initiatives. Uh, one is, of course, this uh, Youth for Biosec uh, Biosecurity uh, Workshop by uh, UNODA. And uh, second is uh, um, um, something called the CO uh, Youth Forum, which was uh, jointly organized by a, a UN Office of Disarmament Affairs and the South Korean government. Uh, I would uh, briefly talk about uh, both of these. Uh, so first, uh, uh, about the Youth for Biosec uh, Workshop, I would... Uh, uh, again, echo the sentiments of uh, other uh, other colleagues and uh, fellow panelists who have uh, also been part of uh, this uh, uh, this really uh, insightful, uh, great uh, workshop. And I learned a lot uh, in the in the whole exercise. And especially as Myra uh, just mentioned, like even after the workshop, there has been this network that has been built, and it it continues to be a really great learning experience for me personally. Uh, in terms of the things that I learned there, uh, one of the most important ones is about uh, knowing about different opportunities that are out there in biosecurity areas, which I was uh, not uh, aware about. Uh, even though I have a PhD in molecular biology, I, had, uh, I did not know about those opportunities that exist. And then uh, also the current state of the academic literature that is there. Uh, what actually are the areas where uh, uh, different biosecurity-related things 
uh, academics are trying to figure out and what kind of research is going on. Also, the current state of uh, uh, the current focus of the issues that are being deliberated at international and multilateral forums. So that was another uh, good uh, learning point. Also, uh, about the different uh, initiatives uh, that uh, bring the elements of equity, inclusion, and diversity in the whole uh, conversation about biosecurity. So that was another really revealing experience for me. Uh, now, I would uh, mention a little bit about this uh, Seoul Youth uh, uh, Forum and uh, the uh, Seoul Youth Declaration that followed. So I was uh, very fortunate to be one of the 25 uh, people selected uh, from all over the world to participate in the Seoul Youth Forum, which happened in the uh, month of June uh, this year. Uh, so there was a, uh, the focus of uh, this particular uh, youth forum was on uh, on intersection uh, between the disarmament and non-proliferation with the three uh, thematic areas. And these areas were uh, gender, uh, new and emerging technologies, and uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, here, uh, all the all the participants we came uh, together to deliberate, discuss, and formulate uh, uh, different set of recommendations about uh, how youth can participate in furthering. Uh, first of all, identifying our own interest in uh, the conversation that goes on into uh, these issues related to disarmament, plus all these thematic uh, three thematic areas, and what is uh, what are the expectations of the youth? Where in what direction we would like to go? Uh, when it comes to uh, these uh, initiatives that are going, uh, that are already uh, discussions that are going on at the international level. Uh, so I would just highlight uh, some of the points or uh, some of the recommendations that came out of this uh, uh, declaration very quickly. So one is uh, the importance of the disarmament uh, education at all levels, not only at the level of uh, undergrads, even graduate education, but also at the level of uh, policy makers. So many of the policy makers actually who take the policy decision do not know enough about uh, disarmament and what its importance and what direction things are going, uh, but also at the level of institutes and uh, de de developing some kind of uh, institutional structure for furthering this uh, conversation and how we can involve the research institutes and higher education institutes in these conversations. Uh, second uh, is uh, building partnerships, networking, uh, involving in uh, more uh, youth forums. And I think we are already doing it here. And uh, there are, especially in the area of biosecurity, there has been a lot of uh, good network uh, and well-built uh, network uh, of, of young professionals. Other one was uh, inv involving uh, youth in the, at the level of policy making, uh, maybe through youth quotas or some other mechanisms uh, through which uh, a youth could be involved at the, at the level of these deliberation and decision making, because ultimately it is the youth who would be impacted most by the decisions that are being uh, that will be made and uh, that are being discussed right now. So our in involvement is extremely important from that point of view. And also, uh, um, I also, uh, as part of this whole uh, initiative, I, I helped prepare the some of the recommendation related to gender issues and uh, uh, how we should uh, facilitate the greater participation and leadership of all genders and uh, then the importance of gender segregated data and uh, gender responsive disarmament education. So some of those issues uh, were discussed, and uh, uh, maybe we can discuss it uh, later in the other as part of other questions. But uh, here I will end, end my uh, initial remarks. Thank you very much, Remy. Over to you. Thank you very much, Soyesh, and uh, certainly nice also to uh, to hear you uh, your testimony about how the use for disarmament and use for biosecurity networks are complementary and uh, reinforces each other. And uh, we've been involving the youth champion for disarmament as well in the in the workshop this year and i think this has created bridge and you're one of the example of that so uh, certainly another good illustration of of that um time is flying already and uh, uh, i'd like to uh, of course uh, open the floor for for any question the audience might have i think it was very useful to hear from you uh, give this um, uh, good insight about the different initiatives that are uh, flourishing, existing, reinforcing each other, uh, and uh, probably a good uh, opportunity for uh, delegates in the audience as well uh, to get to know the different uh, the different initiatives the diff and the potential of, of the youth networks uh, that you are uh, constituting. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for, for questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat or any hand raised. So in the interest of time, I'd like to, uh, to, to ask uh, uh, you, all the panelists, uh, 
maybe a forward-looking question. Uh, since we are currently uh, in the middle of the meetings of experts that some of you are following and the meeting of state parties uh, is upcoming with the review conference uh, soon as well. And uh, I, I would like to know what, what are your expectations on, on, on those uh, important meetings uh, that are upcoming? Uh, how do you think youth uh, should be involved and what do you think uh, youth could bring to the discussions? Some of you have already been uh, br providing some answers to that. Uh, and some of you have also, like I was mentioning, some uh, regional initiatives that could uh, build up a dynamic regionally, especially in the Global South. So if you want to develop on that as well, uh, please feel free. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll give the floor back to uh, Geoffrey if you want to elaborate uh, more on those questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Remy, for bringing me back to the floor. I know time is running fast. Um, I just want to uh, give highlight on some of the initiatives that we have in place uh, in Africa, as in by Africa, you know, in, in the relation to our security. The first one that we, we have is that uh, currently we are, we, are, we are organizing a big international conference, and uh, it will be... Uh, basically having the synthetic biology and the biosecurity component. And we have, uh, you know, great lineup of biosecurity experts and specialists who are going to give their talks uh, in areas of synthetic uh, biology and biosecurity because you cannot separate synthetic biology and biosecurity. So that is one of the, uh, the measures that we are putting in place to implement uh, creating awareness about uh, biosecurity and synthetic biology in Africa. And the second one is um, in line with that conference, we have another program that is sponsored by Jinko Bioworks. Uh, we have emerging leaders in synthetic biology and biosecurity in Africa. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the scientists that we have selected from about 15 countries in, uh, in Africa. These are great scientists, uh, the first core that we want to build their capacity uh, in the areas of uh, synthetic biology, but more especially uh, to have them interact with thought leaders in, you know, and experts in biosecurity during the conference. So this is another initiative that we have in place to, you know, uh, build capacity in biosecurity and creating awareness. Um, also, uh, we have the ambassadors program. We have our ambassadors from all the five African regions. And, you know, these are more of uh, uh, communication and advocacy uh, for biosecurity and, you know, synthetic biology, but more uh, specifically, you know, to advocate for this uh, legal framework, you know, to regulate biosafety and biosecurity in different uh, member states. So. That is also another element of our initiative of trying to push for synthetic biology, biosecurity, and the legal framework to be in place in all the African nations. So in relation to uh, my expectation, you know, as, Man as, as Nelson Mandela said, uh, the youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. So it's very important that we are, we are, you know, they are bringing us together, you know, to make decisions for the future because we are going to be the leaders in the future. So the decision starts now. And also in the areas of policy making, you know, we want uh, youth also to be involved, like um, like each member state, uh, member state that would uh, have to adopt or adapt to a legal framework work for about security and about safety youth uh, should be involved in making such decision and also meetings like uh, the meetings of experts uh, that is taking place here we want youth also to be there to give their views so that all the decisions that are being made are inclusive and you know to promote uh, biotechnology across the globe thank you Thank you very much, Geoffrey, for uh, giving details of those important initiatives that you're leading in the, in, in, in the African region, and that's certainly very important and in link, uh, very relevant to what's being discussed in MX2 today. Um, I'd like to give the floor now to, to Javier, as I know that you're also conducting a, 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 an initiative 
linked to the PwC and disarmament in general uh, from Argentina and uh, in Latin America. If you want to tell us more about that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Remy. Yeah, um, so uh, back in 2019 or early 2020, uh, we thought it was a necessity of an NGO to push us for changes regarding uh, weapons and mass destructions and help with, with capacity building uh, issues locally and regionally. And along with some colleagues, uh, some of them are online today, so I want to say hi to them. So we launched the initiative for global security, ICSEC.core. And so this initiative aims for the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destructions. And we always like to focus on where are the gaps regarding these issues and always trying to push for those changes that could uh, bridge those gaps. And in this sense, we organized several workshops uh, during 2020 and 2021, for example, regarding the state of the pandemic in South America. And another one, along with uh, uh, NTI and Cachetano Radio University from Peru, promoting the Spanish version of Global Health Security Index uh, from NTI and Sean Hopkins University, and um, some other uh, webinars or workshops regarding newer issues that are not part of the conversation right now. And for example, we are organizing a webinar to be held, uh, we think, in November. Uh, covering uh, one thing that uh, Sharfi said before about uh, lack of a legal framework regarding biosafety, biosecurity in, in South America. So what we're trying to do is to learn lessons from the African experience, There's some African experience that have made major steps on it. And in South America, it's not the case, uh, except from Chile, it's not the case. So. Uh, we're trying to uh, bring decision makers to the table to the discussions. That's our goal. And um, we're going to promote that webinar on some social media in the next week. So uh, you're welcome to, to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, and another important uh, regional initiative that uh, certainly is the good illustration of uh, how the co-organizers project and initiative can link to uh, to use driven um, to use driven projects, uh, which is great to to see develop. Um, we are a bit behind schedule, uh, but I, I I just want to check with Mayra, uh, Soyesh, and Isha if if any of you wants to elaborate on uh, on your aspirations for for the upcoming. Uh, meetings uh, of the BWC and how you think Hughes could uh, contribute to to the discussion. Any of you would like to uh, to take the floor on that? Maybe I can go if no one else. Um, so sure, yeah, sir. thank you. Uh, very quickly. Uh, a uh, couple of things. One is, uh, I, I still feel that biosecurity, the whole field of biosecurity is still a very niche area and there are very relatively small number of professionals working there. So I would uh, really like to see happening in the future is better linkages with the broader science policy and science advice mechanism at the national and international level. Also uh, improved connections with science diplomacy in particular. Uh, second thing, uh, uh, from speaking from the Global South perspective, there are uh, some many unique challenges related to uh, Global South. That's uh, the resource constraint, the lack of expertise in the uh, biosec area, uh, the lack of a robust uh, policy advice mechanism, and also uh, lack of uh, biosecurity standard and guide standards and guidelines. Uh, so even though they are there, they're not always implemented well. So what can be done, uh, how uh, international bodies and other countries can handhold and support uh, countries in the global south building those kind of capacity. So I think uh, if we can have some, some conversation on those issues, I think that, that those, those would be very useful. And lastly, uh, how uh, the, there, is, uh, there are discussions uh, on uh, having a science advice mechanism uh, as part of uh, BWC. So how young scientists can be involved in this uh, kind of uh, uh, upcoming mechanism that is uh, being elaborated upon. So just those points. Thank you very much. Thanks, Soyesh. Very interesting uh, yes, perspective and uh, leads for, for reflection among among youth and, uh, and directly with, with state parties. Uh, Maida and Isha, would any of you would like to uh, 
to add something before we um, we close this uh, this panel? Uh, I was um, going to. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You're first, Pl Isha. Pl please, Isha. Uh, I was just going to say, I think uh, everyone's brought up some really great points. Um, and I think, you know, this conversation today is a starting point and should be a platform and a springboard that we can kind of continue on um, and creating more spaces and platforms for youth informed um, science and policy uh, recommendations and integration um, is really great. And recognizing that biosecurity is multidisciplinary. Um, and collaborations need to happen across um, across fields, but across also perspectives. Um, I think Suryesh brought up some really great points on, um, you know, North South collaborations to ensure uh, all viewpoints are, are adequately heard and addressed um, and really continuing um, sort of that 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 forum and creating more forums and spaces for this to happen. And I think Myra will probably add uh, some, some thoughts on this as well. Yes, thank you, Isha. I think that's, um, as you say, this is kind of a starting point. And, and I would love to see in the future that maybe uh, the BWC has a scientific advisory group just composed by young scientists to give our perspectives. Um, also, I think that diplomats from each country should contact young scientists to work on guidelines, guidelines and best practices on biosafety and biosecurity to be implemented at the national level, because nowadays we don't have in many countries, and I would suggest from Latin America, uh, national biosecurity uh, guidelines on uh, laws. So I think at that point, that would be very interesting to see these changes in the future. And, and also I think we should um, put biosecurity and science diplomacy on undergraduate careers so they already know about these issues and they are more involved about these issues in the future so I think that uh, of course if we create more opportunities um, and we could just get more people involved in these issues uh, for the future that could be something great and um, if we have uh, I think if they had been younger more knowledge about all of these and more opportunities in this way, they could be involved. Uh, and not at the point that maybe we are getting involved in our careers. Many of us already have a master's degree or we, they are pursuing a, a, a PhD. So we are kind of, we still are the youth, but I think we are uh, not so young as we would love maybe to be involved with these issues. So if we could just have these opportunities uh, and at an undergraduate level to start uh, knowing about these things, about dual use, about science diplomacy, I think that would be an amazing change for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Myra. And you've just raised uh, an important point, which is uh, awareness raising. Uh, and certainly the initiatives you've been talking about, all of you uh, uh, have that as one of the main objectives, but you're always right when you say that there is more to do in the STEM curriculum, uh, especially with younger uh, scientists are there, they're starting their uh, career and uh, academic professional life in, in the life science. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our five panelists today. Uh, we could uh, discuss uh, much more issues. Unfortunately, time is limited and I'm sure we'll have other opportunities in the future to do so. Um, we had five panelists today, but as I mentioned at the beginning, we have much more young scientists involved in, uh, in our network in all those initiatives. And if state parties, if delegates in the audience wishes, wish to, to contact them, we are more than happy to facilitate that. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to, uh, to now give the floor uh, to my uh, fellow colleague uh, organizer, Mr. Chris Isaac uh, for, the, for the second panel. Uh, Chris, Chris is a program assistant at NTI Bio and also a member of the IGM Safety and Security Committee. And yeah, with so many affiliations, uh, you could have been in the first panel also, Chris, but you're very fortunate to have you to moderate the second panel. Uh, so with that, uh, the floor is yours, Chris. Thank you so much, Remy. It is a pleasure to be here to moderate this session. Uh, so as you said, I'm Chris Isaac, a scientist by training, longtime iGEMR, LB alum, and now program assistant at NTI. Uh, briefly, NTI is a nonprofit whose mission is to transform global health security by driving systemic solutions to both nuclear and biological threats imperiling humanity. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our next set of panelists. Uh, each group will have a short five-minute presentation on the 
uh, important and innovative work that they're doing related to uh, safeguarding uh, science and security. So uh, I'd like to begin with the winners of NTI's 2020 Next Generation for Biosecurity Competition. Uh, we have Mr. Jonas Sandbrink, Ms. Uh, Srihashta uh, Musunuri, and Joshua Monrad. Jonas is a biosecurity researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute and a medical student at the University of Oxford. His research interests include dual use potential of life sciences research and biotechnology, as well as fast response countermeasures, including vaccine platforms. Srihashta is a fourth year student at Stanford University studying biochemistry and computer science. She works on universal vaccine development at the ChemH Institute and helps run a collaborative fellowship for Stanford and Cambridge students interested in biosecurity. Joshua is about to join the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, where he will uh, research pandemic preparedness and biosecurity. He recently completed a public health degree at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as the London School of Economics. He holds an undergraduate degree in economics and ethics from Yale University. Uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, uh, I think we can go right into the next slide, please. So um, we also participated in, as Chris mentioned, in the um, 2020 uh, Next Gen Biosecurity Competition. And what motivated was that not only has the ongoing pandemic highlighted the world's vulnerability to biological threats, it also led to an incredible surge in life science research across the globe. Uh, much, of which, much of which clearly has been critical in the pandemic response. So we set out to analyze whether this research had been conducted in places with adequate oversight for dual use research of concern or DERC, um, using the DERC indicator from the inaugural Global Health Security Index. And considering that this uh, index, uh, the GHSA, identified oversight weaknesses concerning DERC in virtually all countries, um, across different sort of uh, uh, income levels. Uh, it was no surprise to find that the vast majority of SARS-CoV-2 related research as seen in this table uh, was conducted in countries with limited or no oversight of DERC. Um, and so essentially uh, this finding underscores the importance of creating, strengthening and implementing DERC frameworks across the globe. And next slide. Now, even within the United States, um, which by this current metric is uh, considered the front runner in terms of dual use regulation, assessment relies upon this sort of narrow framework um, that is limited to research being flagged on the basis of whether it uses these 15 select agents or involves seven um, different types of uh, specified experiments. Um, and this sort of conception is unable to account for research that um, maybe is on things like immune evasion or involves transfer, uh, transferability of a given insight to um, more harmful pathogens. And so what we're really advocating for is um, pushing for a sort of broader framework that considers um, both the risks and benefits of research um, and information that is disseminated in, in association with um, certain types of life sciences research. And most importantly, thinking about whether there may be safer alternatives to answering those same research questions um, or solving those problems. Okay, next slide. Uh, like Hasha just said, dual use oversight does not only need to be broad, but it also needs to be comprehensive. And in particular, regulation of dual use research cannot just be limited to the publication stage. And this is, for instance, demonstrated by the search and the use of preprint service during the COVID pandemic, as you can see in the left graphic. Um, so really, we need to track these dual use risks throughout the life science uh, cycle and um, work to address these risks comprehensively. Additionally, private stakeholders and funding bodies are also really key in driving biotechnology progress and hence they need to be involved in, in any dual use oversight as well. And to really make all of this tractable and to allow dual use to be tracked throughout the research life cycle, you need to engage with the scientists and the scientists themselves need to um, develop biosecurity um, understanding and, and sensitivity. And hence, really, we need strong social norms and education around such risks. And this will be really critical to enable tracking dual use research 
risks throughout the life science cycle. Next slide, please. Okay, so overall, um, we take uh, we, we we came up with a few takes of takeaways uh, in our competition paper. So, firstly, all countries really need to develop or strengthen their policies, and um, secondly, these DERC frameworks need to be comprehensive and account for a range of dual use research concerns, including experimental approaches that are transferred between agents, and hence not just limited to lists of select agents. And lastly, really dual use management must apply throughout the entire research process and uh, needs to involve both private and pub public stakeholders and grant makers. Um, so these are the findings from, from our competition paper. I, I think it's really awesome that the competition brought the three of us together because um, it's been really enjoyable to work with them, with, with Hashu and Joshua. And uh, indeed, we actually uh, decided to take this research further and um, write a follow-up paper as, as well, which uh, hopefully will be out very soon in a few weeks. Uh, so I'm quite excited about the opportunity presented to, to us by NTI and NextGen to really um, yeah, bring forward our ideas and, and um, allow us to, to also contribute to this global discussion. So thank you. And thank you all for the interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to turn the floor now to uh, Ms. Svenja Vinka, one of the coordinators of the iGEM Dual Use of Research of Concern workshops. Svenja is a PhD student at the Center for Biotechnology in Bielefeld, Germany, working on the translational incorporation of non-canonical amino acids and directed evolution. Additionally, as a member of the iGEM Biosafety and Biosecurity Committee, she aims to develop innovative teaching projects to communicate the importance of considering uh, biosecurity risks. Svenja, over to you. Hi everyone and thanks for the kind introduction and for inviting me here today. So as Chris already mentioned, I'm going to present the iGEM Dual Use Research of Concern workshops. I first came into contact with oh. yeah, right. I first came into contact with biosecurity issues during 2018 when I supervised a student research team co competing in the synthetic biology competition called iGEM. My team had the aim to engineer bacteria to degrade metal waste. And then one of the team members raised the question, what if our metal eating bacteria are misused to degrade functional electronics? At that moment, none of the team members and none of our supervisors actually knew the answer to that. And at that moment, I was shocked because I realized that we don't teach this fundamental question of what to do actually when you identify a potential of misuse during life science education. My team felt similar and they wanted to find out if it was just a coincidence that they in Bielefeld didn't know about these issues. They conducted an, an international survey where they found out that 69% of the participants did not know the definition of dual use in the context of science. 58% did not know a contact person to ask in case of concern. 61% criticized the poor education at their university and 76% want a more pronounced education at their universities. Because of this survey, my team started an outreach campaign within the competition to teach other teams about the relevance of um, teaching dual use issues. But IGEM is an annual competition and in 2019, none of the teams followed up on this approach and worked on an outreach campaign. So Irina and I decided that we would like to work on an ongoing approach in the competition. And um, we had the aim to design an in interactive workshop enabling to understand the importance of considering dual use risks. And the product of that were the dual use research workshops. The main aim was to give information about risks and relevance and why we need to consider these risks in really every symbio research project. We decided to work on case studies because we wanted the students to practice to actually apply this knowledge. We had a lot of time for discussion to learn more why students want to learn about these topics or not want to learn about these topics with the ultimate aim to encourage interdisciplinary work so that the students don't see humanities as separate discipline from the life sciences. We are now in the second year hosting these workshops and from the experience we had so far, we were able to draw some conclusions for education and maybe even some policy recommendation when it comes to dual use. The first thing we heard about that in the first case study as well, dual use risks exist in non-pathogen research as well. So we need to teach 
researchers who are not working with pathogens that reduce risks exist there as well because they are the only ones who actually can work on mitigation um, frameworks because most frameworks right now don't focus on this kind of research. The second thing is that education about biosecurity needs to be intact. Students struggle a lot with biosecurity risks because they are something very familiar to most of, unfamiliar to most of them. And we don't just want the researchers to know about these risks, we want them to um, apply countermeasures to identify them on their own. The third one is that we need good practice example. This is mainly because most students and even researchers perceive biosecurity considerations as administrative burden or as even hindrance of free research. And we need a better communication between policymaker and the life science educational machinery to actually convince and support universities in integrating teaching approach. As long as we don't have the sufficient um, dual use education at universities, NGOs that focus on life science education like IGEM can build an important um, bridge at this time, because we have this combination of actually having experts from the field on the safety committee working together with students who bring in new ideas um, so together they can find solutions to current problems. And we heard about that as well in um, the talks earlier. The students right now will go into a broad range of sectors and they will bring community values in, for example, academia or industry where they go later. And the third one, I think we're not talking about this enough. We're always talking about raising researchers to mitigating risks. But when you get young talents in synthetic biology actually excited about these topics, they are also able to um, provide some biotechnical solutions to problems right now and not just mitigating risks and risky projects. So with this approach in IGEM, with youth-led initiatives in combination with working together with experts, we will hopefully prevent that more teams in the future are clueless to do what then when they identify the potential of misuse. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Svenja. Uh, I'd like to turn the floor now to Ms. Uh, Shrestha Rath. Uh, she is a regional program coordinator at, after IGEM where she is leading the team of IGEM ambassadors from Asia and Oceania. Uh, apart from being involved in various after IGEM initiatives, she also has been part of the organizing committee for the Global Community Bio Summit, organized by the Community Biotech in Initiative at MIT Media Lab. She graduated with a master's in biological sciences from the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Bhopal, India, and has been awarded the KVPY Fellowship by the Department of Science and Technology, uh, administered by the government of India. Take it away. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. Am, am I audible for now? Awesome, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very glad uh, to be here and to talk about some of the case studies of contributions from young people towards responsible science. Next, please. Um, I have been fortunate to be part of uh, more than one wonderful international organizations that are tirelessly working towards bringing young people together on issues and questions uh, that we're already discussing here um, that matter to us, that matter to our future. Uh, I'll be walking through uh, brief case studies uh, of how the youth have been charting the path in the field of biosecurity and making the way for everyone else to follow. Next, please. Yeah, uh, starting with the values and risks workshop, um, like all of life science and biotechnology, IGM projects, uh, as uh, Svenja already mentioned, uh, carry some risk, uh, including potential harm to the team, their colleagues, uh, the communities, and the environment. Next, please. Uh, so in 2020, IGM developed uh, and, and implemented a new workshop series on values and risks. These workshops were led by IGEM ambassadors uh, to raise awareness of potential risks within IGEM projects that teams probably do not know of, uh, improve the content submitted by the teams in their safety and security form, which is mandatory for all IGEM projects. Um, the workshop was also um, carrying a hazard identification exercise that follows the misadventures of a hypothetical team example and facilitated discussions to help identify areas of uncertainty, um, answer unanswered questions uh, and, and stuff like that. 
Next, please. Um, and the key outcomes from the workshop that we ran in 2020 um, was that uh, we were able to identify two dual use projects uh, within the IGM projects from 2020. Uh, one of the teams even went ahead and developed uh, containment systems within their project. Uh, another team was helped with finding additional information regarding the national rules and regulations. It's wonderful that we are talking about, uh, we, ha we are having this conversation today because the best case scenario obviously would be working with national agencies invested in biosecurity work so that we are able to support IGM teams better with, with your help. Next. Um, our key takeaways from, from the from the value and risk workshop was that uh, the safety and security committee explored better ways to give feedback. Um, then we also realized yeah, we, we also realized that workshop formats need a good revision. And lastly, uh, the workshops were so well so well um, received that we had to reiterate them this year. That's in 2021. So we went ahead. Next week. So we went ahead and reiterated the workshops in 2021, uh, also expanded them from 130 IGMAs attending these workshops in last year to 200 IGMAs att attending them this year. Uh, we expanded uh, in our accessibility issue as well. Um, no more where the workshops were being given in just in English, but also in English, Spanish, uh, French, and Mandarin. Uh, so, uh, so that we can talk to teams in the language that they are comfortable and have uh, enriching discussions um, that in languages that the teams are comfortable in. Next, please. And uh, yeah, um, so one of the key takeaways for me was this attendee who was uh, one of the attendees for, for the workshops being held this year. Um, the, the, the fact that uh, she mentions that her team not just realized the importance of risk evaluation for their IGM project, but now also want to help future IGM teams uh, understand the same. I think this is a wonderful example of sustainable engagement and, and that, uh, that's one of the key takeaways for me from the values and risk workshop we ha had this year. Next, please. The second case study is that of uh, the policy hackathon that we had for the very first time at after IGM amidst uh, the global pandemic last year. Uh, the policy hackathon was um, was was brought together uh, IGMers, policy enthusiasts, and anyone who was interested to understand how uh, scientists and policymakers can work together. Um, next, please. We we brought, brought the attendees together, uh, teamed them up, uh, had them uh, develop their uh, recommendations upon certain themes, uh, pitch their idea, pitch their report, and then uh, announced winners and and also. Uh, uh, put them in touch with people who are uh, expert in the field. Uh, next, please. So the the um, the participants basically had to submit a report and a video pitch. Here's a small video of uh, the policy hackathon. Um, the hackathons, the the all the uh, policy recommendations from the teams still live on on the Juggle platform. So feel free to visit the policy recommendations from the teams um, on a variety of topics that they had worked on uh, last year. Next, please. Um, and one of the, uh, again, a uh, few of the attendees uh, mentioned some really good points regarding the policy hackathon last year, uh, which gave them a platform to develop policies that respond to the need of the world as fast as we develop scientific solutions. And uh, they also recommended that we need more such hackathons uh, where we are in interfacing with experts and uh, people who are new to the field. Next, please. The, the third case study would be that of the delegates program. The after IGM delegates program gives IGM students and alumni uh, an opportunity to um, attend key international meetings and be part of global conversations around synthetic biology. Uh, IGM delegates usually um, engage with meeting attendees, uh, stakeholders on the topic, um, even if others' views are opposed in the context of these discussions through their work in IGM. The delegates have skills to find a middle ground through their cooperation. Um, these are uh, some of the delegates from 2016 um, all through 2021 who have attended the Conventions of Biological Diversity, uh, BWC, and many of them have, uh, I think you can see Chris there, 
and many of them have also go, gone ahead and been part of the national delegation team um and some of some of them such as Ronnie uh, Tessa and um, I think Chris himself are part of uh, safety and security committee at IGEM uh, at IGEM and yeah uh, the delegates program has been uh, running wonderfully uh, giving people uh, IGEM as a chance to interface next please um, I think uh, Geoffrey already touched upon synthetic biology uh, in bio Africa uh, but I just wanted to touch upon uh, the global alliance of synthetic biology associations that IGM is trying to build. Uh, starting last year, we have been trying to bring together formal and informal organizations led by IGM alumni. And um, one such organization is the Synbio Association. Next, please. That's running the biosecurity conference this year. Very excited for that. Many of that, many IGMers are, um, um, are in the organizing team are, and also are going to attend. Um, so. Uh, this, this interface is definitely going to be um, one that's uh, really exciting for many people who are interested in the field. Next, please. Um, coming to open science and biosecurity, um, I have also been working with uh, just one giant, giant lab as a community, as their community intern. Um, and I've also been part of the Global Bio Summit, as Chris mentioned. Next, please. So, Juggle has been. Uh, has started uh, open COVID-19 initiative last year uh, with around 120 projects and around 1500 members uh, supporting that project. Uh, the open COVID-19 initiative has, uh, has a robust board of uh, members for um, biosafety and biosecurity related aspects. So there is, there is uh, much, uh, um, much work in, in open science uh, area as well regarding biosecurity. Uh, the next example is that of uh, uh, yes. The next uh, the next one is uh, an innovative approach that two grad students, uh, Lucas and Xavier Lewis uh, from ODU, uh, have been taking for bio cyber security. Uh, they presented uh, their uh, biosecurity board game last year at the Global Bio Summit, uh, which they created so that they can help experts from different fields uh, get in touch with each each other understand each other um, and essentially the board game was was uh, was a way to generate conversations to engage people in uh, bio cyber security and it definitely did a wonderful job uh, i have links that i can share later um, so that everyone can check out the board the board game which is really really interactive and can be played over a uh, virtual setup next please um, so given these um given these um uh, case studies uh, what works is what I've understood is um, an opportunity, um, an engagement which is which gives an opportunity to interface, which is sustainable and which is meaningful for the youth, for the young people, um, is something that works and would uh, definitely be something that uh, young people look forward to to be able to engage in as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see all of the different initiatives and how they work together. Um, so we now have time for a brief uh, seven minute Q&A session. So uh, if members of the, uh, the audience would like to indicate their uh, questions in the chat or raise their hand, I'd be happy to call on you in turn. Uh, to get things started, I'd love to ask the, uh, each group of panelists uh, the following question. Uh, globally, the next generation is leading the way on many issues like climate change, peace and stability. Do you see this kind of engagement in the life sciences? And if not, what do you think are the greatest barriers to the development of the next generation leaders in biosecurity? So we can kick it off here. Um, so I think really a great limitation at the moment is that many people just don't hear about biosecurity early throughout their careers and uh, in their life sciences training and really if we think about how we can tackle these challenges comprehensively, I think we just need to really involve uh, scientists in these issues and uh, thinking about dual use risks and um, how we can really mitigate them. So I think really it will be critically important to um, include education on these um, issues in life sciences training programs at universities. And, and furthermore, then also uh, really create avenues for how people that really want to 
yeah, use their careers to mitigate these risks, then can get into these areas and can um, get onto careers in biosecurity and pandemic preparedness more broadly. So I think those are two pathways that we should look at. Thank you so much, Jonas. A uh, question for Svenja. Uh, given your experiences, uh, what do you think are the most impactful opportunities that those within this generation can create for the next generation? I think it would be really good to have more formats um, where the youth can talk um, in discussions to experts who are currently working in the field and in a way that um, the youth is encouraged to actually bring in new ideas because I feel like especially for life scientists who haven't learned much about um, international relations or legal aspect it's very hard to um, join these discussions because they don't know much about these aspects and maybe are even afraid to say something stupid in discussions like that. So um, it definitely would help to um, create the room for more of these discussions where these young talents can learn about the other aspects and um, yeah, experts are helping them getting started learning more about humanities. Thank you. Uh, for Shretha. Um, so do you think that there, given your diverse uh, experience with and involvement with many op, uh, organizations and initiatives, do you think that there are sufficient career ladders in biosecurity to continue to funnel talent up to engage and keep talented professionals over the long term? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. Um, I, I believe globally there's definitely more now than there were before, uh, but some regions even today still struggle to put together uh, basic biosecurity related opportunities um, um, and and I think that that can definitely change um, given the kind of engagement that youth has already been showing since the past couple of years in biosecurity related matters so we need to we need to be able to break the silos between uh, the expertise and the am amateur enthusiasm uh, to be able to have more uh, biosecurity related uh, career ladders there Thank you. Yeah, it's it's very important to sort of uh, de-silo a lot of these areas related to safety and security. Uh, bringing it back to Joshua, uh, could you talk a little bit about your vision for the engagement of the next gen uh, of biosafety and biosecurity professionals and how the, uh, the next gen competition uh, sort of informed that view? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Chris um... Well, first of all, I think one thing that, that I've been thinking about is the, the, the competition very explicitly encouraged, in fact, I think required uh, collaborations with uh, across countries. Um, and, you know, we had three nationalities uh, uh, represented on our team and about as many nationalities as there are participants in this meeting today. Um, and I think that is something that, that definitely is, is, um, is going to be imperative. And um, as was also just mentioned about uh, career ladders, I think, making sure that it's not just, um, you know, the, the most resource institutions that, uh, you know, take the uh, lead the way on this, but, but making sure that these opportunities are extended globally um, and across regions, I think is going to be really vital. Thank you so much. And a, a final question for Harshu. Um, what types of engagement methods would be most effective in bringing the next generation into these discussions and, and why? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, discussions like these are great, um, just because, uh, as Joshua mentioned, it's really important to bring in sort of international perspectives um, and, and learn about what sort of frameworks exist, not just where you're working, but also uh, around the world. Um, but I think specifically targeting um, the sort of next generation or, or youth in biosecurity will involve um, taking somewhat of an academic approach and like sort of legitimizing the discussion around biosecurity. Um, and then one of the ways to do that is simply uh, by having professors and the leaders in your own field within your own universities talking about it um, and, and teaching about it and having active discussions with students. Um, and I think beyond that, in the absence of, of sort of um, academics who are able to do this maybe at your own university, um, international or, or inter, inter institutional collaborations um, between students that are maybe interested in biosecurity, connecting them with more senior researchers in the field um, or, or 
other opportunities that they may otherwise not heard of, um, I think is going to be continue is, is going to continue to, to be very important in um, sort of legitimizing the field and, and increasing participation um, going into the future. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, so from our panelists, we've heard a lot about how it's important to engage uh, young scientists early, engage them effectively, and really bring down sort of these silo walls between the humanities and hard sciences. And I think that uh, everyone on this call can uh, really leave uh, knowing that the young scientists want to be involved in these issues and that uh, their involvement is going to be uh, critical to uh, keeping uh, safety and security moving forwards in the life sciences. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your contributions and turn the floor back over to Remy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to all our, our panelists. Uh, the event is already coming to an end. And uh, what's left for me is uh, only to uh, introduce uh, our uh, uh, co-organizer, uh, Ronit, Mrs. Ronit Langer, uh, who is a coordinator at uh, After iGEM, and uh, who will kindly deliver the closing remarks for, for this event. Uh, Ronit, over to you. Thank you so much, Remy, and thank you to everyone today who came um, to both participate and to listen. It's always amazing and incredible to watch all of these young leaders in this field come together. And it's been an incredible opportunity to be able to work across all these different organizations that all share the common goal of encouraging um, youth perspectives in biosecurity and responsible innovation. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna quickly talk through a lot of the opportunities that have been mentioned already today. Um, a lot of you who are attending here have participated in one or more of these. So just to remind you of all the opportunities that are available and please feel free to get in touch with any of these organizations that you'd like to um, collaborate with in the future. So starting off with the Youth for Biosecurity Initiative, which we had lots of participants for here today. Um, this year was the second year um, of their biosecurity diplomacy workshop, and hopefully we will see a third edition of that biosecurity diplomacy workshop in the future. Um, and it's been an amazing opportunity to really engage young scientists in the BWC directly. Next slide, please. Um, we also heard from members of the IFLA Global Mentorship Program um, and remembering Stephanie from the opening remarks, she's the person to get in touch with that, but it really encourages peer-to-peer -peer, um, mentorship um, across the world. Next slide, please. Also, as we heard most recently from the winners of last year's Next Generation for Biosecurity Competition from NTI and NextGen, um, the competition for this year close would be on the lookout for the winner announcement, I believe coming out around October, so soon, and also definitely be on the lookout for um, future competitions um, and more opportunities from that network. Next slide. Also, as uh, Shressa mentioned, we ran a policy hackathon for iGEM teams last year. Um, and we'll be running it again this year, open to anyone to participate. So if you um, have an interest in seeing what iGEM is all about and seeing our alumni led initiatives, um, please feel free to join that meeting and to in general, check out all the opportunities that we had that are by our community for our community and for the broader community. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, we have the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Initiative, which we also had many fellows represented here today on this call, um, and really uh, be on the lookout for the next uh, cohort announcement for LB. And also, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with Matthew Watson, for, who is also there for the opening remarks. Um, next slide, please. Um, and some other opportunities from that have also been highlighted today from organizations not necessarily directly represented um, in this meeting, but one is the Youth for Disarmament Initiative, also being run by UNODA, um, that has their youth forum that we've had some participants from, and the Next Generation Global Health Security Network Mentorship Program is also an amazing opportunity for global collaboration and mentorship. So I hope what you've taken away from all of this is that there's lots of opportunities and also this community um, 
is growing rapidly and we all have these amazing opportunities to come together. Next slide. So just to, to wrap up today, uh, we really just wanted to end by saying, you too can expand youth participation. If you are a youth yourself, you can get involved in any of those initiatives, but really feel free to contact um, anyone, any of the organizers of this event. First of all, if you know of other similar programs that are available in your country, we're really looking to always expand this network and always looking to grow the number of participants and be able to share that with our entire community. And if you or your organization is looking to bring more youth into biosecurity, looking for ideas about how to engage more youth in biosecurity, or get in touch with any of our participants from any of the various programs in your country, please feel free to reach out to us. We're really looking, again, to create networks and connections. And so with that, just wanted to say thank you again, everyone, so much for participating today and for coming and attending. And we look forward to seeing you at more of our events soon. So. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye everyone.